Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Gary's gonna talk about some software too today. Today we have Gary Nealon, he's founder of RTA Cabinet Store and he's built an eight-figure e-commerce business. He's the owner of Rocks Group, which is a collection of e-commerce sites in the home improvement niche of all things, which includes one of the largest online distributors and importers of kitchen cabinets in the US. They've been featured on over 80 shows, HDTV, a and and several others. He's been featured on the Inc. 500, 5000, as well as Philly's 100 fastest growing companies. If that wasn't enough, Gary, you also run winetrailadventures.com and Nealon Solutions Marketing Company. Gary, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. You know, there's a lot to discuss, and I want to talk about, you're an expert in e-commerce. We met at um, the event in Napa, Mastermind yes. Talks, and I was really impressed with your e-commerce knowledge. There was like a circle of people, and you kept giving some mind-blowing, amazing uh, responses and, and tips on e-commerce. So, you know, the first thing is, <clears throat> we'll get into RTA Cabinet Store and this in the marketing company, but just in general, what's a must for sellers to boost sales? If someone's looking for advice from you, what should they start doing to increase their sales? I mean, probably the, the thing that really kind of boosted our sales and kind of honed in, uh, not only reducing our costs, but kind of getting us a better message was when we really focused on the avatar of our ideal customer. Mm. Um, when we first started out, we were just, you know, it was kitchen cabinets. We were just trying to sell kitchen cabinets. Um, yeah. And when we really sat down and thought about it, we really had more than one customer. We had essentially five different types of customers. Mm. So when we were using the same message to speak to five different people, it wasn't resonating as well as when we actually honed in on what each individual customer was looking for and then mm -hmm. had a custom message created for them. Well, Once we did that, uh, not only did it drop our advertising costs, but it really helped our conversion rates because we were speaking specifically to them instead of just talking to a general audience. Yeah. That's powerful. Direct The power of direct response marketing. So what's one of those customers? Give so, an example, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when you think about kitchen cabinets, we just thought about anybody that owned a house. You know, that's who we were selling to. But right. when we really looked into it, we were talking to essentially the homeowner, um, a contractor, and a builder, mm. a property investor, and a flipper, uh, and a real estate agent. And each one of them had a different reason for buying from us. Wow. Instead of, you know, some might have been price, some might have been uh, convenience uh, or speed of delivery. Uh, others were the quality. So each one, by tailoring the message to them, we were hitting exactly what their pain points were yeah. for when they were buying our product. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the big, one of the biggest shifts that we made in our business models when we started doing that a couple of years ago. And it, you know, a little more legwork on creating multiple funnels and doing all that stuff, but really in, in the long run, it actually helped us out and, and actually reduced our cost for acquisition. When did you first discover to do this? Because it seems like when you're saying it, I'm like, obviously, like I, it's not like I would have sat down and thought that would be my first thing, but it's so powerful when did you first yeah it was um i want to say it was a couple years in um you know we we kind of peaked there for after like i don't know maybe our third or fourth year yeah. sales were growing but they were kind of starting to level off a little bit we we're trying to figure out why are we you know we're competing for the same customer base here with everybody else and there, there's got to be something different that we can do to kind of separate us from what everybody else is doing yeah. literally we put out an ad and people would copy it and it was like you know we we're kind of the leader in that little really niche. yeah um they were just copying everything we were doing, so we were looking for creative ways to kind of generate an audience without having to compete on the same level. Um, yeah, that was one of the strategies. Um, another strategy that we did was we looked at what, based off of those avatars, what are some of the other hobbies that those people had. Mm. Um, so, good example would be for the homeowner. We figured out that our realistically the buyer was actually the female of the house who usually had one or two kids she they control liked, everything the female yeah, yeah. she liked to cook she liked to you know spend time in the kitchen so we started creating social media platforms around cooking and um, mm. gardening and different hobbies that we knew that that particular audience had mm. uh, while they may not have been in the market for kitchens at that time we would give away free cookbooks and get them on our get them used to just dealing with us on a regular basis yeah. then we'd slowly drip in hey you know are you sick of your kitchen or you out, your outdated kitchen or whatever? And just right. kind of drop like you know, that's, small that's genius, Gary. Kitchen. Stuff. I love that. Um, 
not only that, but it, it allowed us to talk to these people that our competitors were not. So we have, you know, we have a cooking Facebook page with I think seventy or eighty thousand. That's amazing. Wow. Followers on it. Yeah. And we can drop ads to these people specific to our campaigns without be having them see the same ads from our competition. So uh, it really gave us like a, na a, a niche market that we could target and still be able to interact with them and, and get some conversions out of it. So uh, I'd say that that was probably phase two of our, our big jump in, in sales. So obviously, you know, my next logical question, you know, I want to ask about what was another message, but how do you get 70 or 1,000 people on a cooking Facebook page? Well, that's the thing when you when you find a niche like that where they're passionate about something yeah. like so the people like cooking is a really good example like people that cook are really passionate about cooking so we're mm -hmm. always looking for new recipes different things so we literally just started giving away recipes we'd uh, uh, our strategy initially for that Facebook campaign was uh, we'd post a couple uh, recipes figure out like over the course of a month which ones were the top ones or which ones got the most likes and, and shares and just put them into a free download and just give them away so people were like oh wait you're giving away free recipes that I could always just see online anyways. So they were e eager to sign up for our email campaigns because we weren't selling them anything. We were really just giving them stuff away. Right. Uh, and then every now and again, we'd slip in, you know, kind of an ad here and there. But we made sure that we weren't spamming them. We weren't doing anything that yeah. made them feel uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, they're, it's the difference between, like, you know, when you try to get them on a mailing campaign for cabinets, people are apprehensive because they know you're trying to sell them something. But when you're literally just giving away free recipes they there's no apprehension there so when you drop in an occasional ad it doesn't feel as intrusive right. as if it's you know just add 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 coming out right you're all about delivering the content and the value and like maybe like five or ten percent of the time just mentioning about you know that may at that point hit uh hit a pain point for them because they're exactly. not always searching for cabinets yeah exactly so yeah we're just you know we're trying to like in that case we're just trying to lay in the background Hopefully, when it comes around time for them to uh, to actually go mm -hmm. shopping, they'll remember that they saw some really nice kitchens, or remember the name, and just kind of go from there. Yeah, it's a long term approach. Not everyone probably is into the long term approach. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's definitely a longer term approach than running the you know, Facebook ads and just <laughs> <laughs> sending them directly to a page that to yeah. buy cabinets. Um, so, talk about one of the other customers. What kind of messaging do you use with? I don't know what the best example, either with the real estate agents or contractors, would be yeah, interesting. So, like with contractors, they're more concerned with um, business growth and um, you know, obviously price points a little bit more mm, important. Make a profit. Yeah. Um, so what we do is we actually put together a contractor dashboard for the back end where we'll, uh, we give them business coaching ideas like marketing strategies. Because mm. obviously if they grow their business, it only helps us in the long run. So. We try to help them from the business standpoint uh, versus the focusing on the price of the cabinets or anything else like that. So we figure if we can bring them in and almost be like a partner, yeah. so the price doesn't isn't as you know, big of an issue. So they're not constantly shopping around. They know that they're getting something of value from us. Mm -hmm. um, property flippers they tend to need speed and um, you know high quality mm -hmm. right away. So somebody gets a property to flip, they're usually on a time crunch. They've got to get the cabinets in and out you know, within a reasonable amount of time. Right. So we focus more on how fast we can deliver them, how fast our, our service is going to be if there is an issue or something like that. Yeah. So uh, again, we're trying to take price out of the issue and just say, here's all the value that we're right. adding to you um, based off of that. Right. That's why you should be buying from us. Yeah, because if you talk more price with them, they're not as interested as, as getting it to them yesterday. I mean, it, it's still in a, you know, still obviously a high on the priority list, but right. still hitting some of those other pain points that most people aren't yeah. focused on. Yeah. So, Gary, I think we could stop the interview right here because, I mean, the avatar speak directly to your customer. That solves that solves ninety percent of things, right? <laughs> and probably, you know, I have to think about that on a daily basis too. Now that you mention it, because it's so important, and we probably forget it a lot of times. So. Yeah, I appreciate like, you starting with that. Actually, well, I mean, it, it kind of is the launching pad for everything else you do too. Because like, even when you're running ads or you're thinking about how to target people on, you know, Facebook ads or Pinterest or wherever, yeah. knowing what your ideal customer is, it makes it a lot easier to narrow down the cost and, and the, the market base that you're focusing on. So mm -hmm. instead of just running generic ads to a wide, you know, to eight million people, you can have really tailored messages yeah. to maybe ten thousand, fifteen thousand. It's going to drop your cost. You're going to yeah. conversion rates are going to go up, and everything's going to be improved just by doing that. So yeah, I, I think it's one of the most important aspects. Uh, you know, maybe when you're first starting, it's not because you're just trying to get traffic through the door. You're just trying to hone your message. But um, you know, at some point, that has to become a major focus. Yeah. No, I can tell you've dialed it in because you know, like it's a mom, one or two kids. She reads 
Home and Garden Magazine, whatever it is, and you could speak directly to those people so easily. Exactly. Um, so two things I want to talk about. Um, TV. You know, yes. I mentioned 80 shows. So I want to hear about how you got on TV and then, you know, some yeah. of the, the milestones there. I don't even know how many shows it is anymore. I think it's even more than that. Yeah. We've, uh, we've been doing probably about 20 a year. What was the first one? Tell me about the first one that you got on. first one was uh, a show called Carter Can. Uh, it had Carter Osterhaus on it. Um, he came from Trading Spaces show from a while back. It was like one of the most popular shows on uh, home improvement shows. Um, interestingly enough, we've gotten in touch with them through press releases. So I used to mm. do a lot of press releases, a lot of uh, guerrilla marketing, just you know putting stuff out online, you know talking about what we're doing. And one of the producers of the show just happened to find our company name, wow. um, and they were like, "We're in a real tight crunch. You know, we need cabinets delivered in I think like a little over a week, uh, and nobody else. They didn't know anybody else that could do it. So we're like, "Yeah, we can do it." Um, so we just figured it out. We got them out to them. Um, they loved it for the first show. They're like, "Can we use you for multiple shows?" I was like, "Absolutely." So what did that require? Did they need it for the set, or what do they need? What did they? So need? it's whenever they're doing like a, a home renovation or whatever, um, they're looking for materials uh, to actually renovate the house. Okay. So they work on such a tight time frame that like they may literally only have two weeks' notice that they need materials. So it's like right. for you know, kitchen typically takes eight to ten weeks. So it's like. <laughs> kind of hard to do. So, uh, you know, right. back eight or nine years ago when we first started, and they were like, they literally had no idea how to get this done. So, uh, we were kind of the only ones that were like, yeah, we'll turn around a week for you if you really need it. Like, wow. we'll get there, don't worry about it. Um, so, that show kind of spawned uh, the producers from that show once it uh, once it was over, went to a couple other shows, and, you know, they just kind of kept spreading the word. Like, these guys are really good to work with. You know, we're flexible and. Uh, we would fly out to some of the shows and we'd help them with the setup and everything. So we really added a lot of value to the to the shows. Um, and for me, it was great because I was getting free marketing material out of it. Like it, the hardest thing for us was to get high quality videos and pictures. So we were getting ah, you can you can take it off like A and E and yeah. like there's our there's our cabinets right there. Yeah. So we, I mean, they would get they would chop it up for us and they would produce nice little commercials and everything for us. Wow. And it's all the high res images. So it's amazing. I was worth more than the the cost of the cabinets for me. I was like. More than happy to help you out with these shows, so that's kind of how the TV stuff started. And it's just, uh, you know, we just kept a, track, a really good track record of working with the shows, and they keep passing us on to other shows and other shows. Do they ever ask you to go on the show? Like, or I've anything? actually been, uh, I've been on camera probably ten times, and they've mm -hmm. cut me out almost every single time. Because <laughs> you're too tall. <laughs> I think so I don't people know. don't know. You're, you're six seven. Yeah, right? six seven. I mean, your head's probably cut off. That's why. Like, they're they're like, they just don't like tall, bald people or what? But they, for whatever reason, they just kept cutting me out of the shows. It's, it's, I think I made it on two. It's I discriminating like two to shots. bald people all over the world. I take offense. Yeah, um, a discrimination or something. I don't know. Like, so you've been on two, though? Like, what are, you doing, what are you doing on camera? Are you actually installing? Are you teaching? Yeah, the one I, the one I, was, uh, I was demonstrating, like, the quality of cabinets and stuff like that. Um, and then the other one I was actually helping install. Um, it, early on, it was a lot easier for us to get kind of those big interactions because um, typically the way those shows work is the lower the budget, the more they're willing to give away uh, because they don't have the money to spend on the materials. Right. So when they first started, like they were willing, okay, we'll put you on camera. We'll, we had them come to our showroom a couple times and they did some in-house stuff. Um, so we got some really good value out of that. Uh, as they the want to create more value because they are doing it on a low budget type of thing. Yeah, yeah. So then, as, like now, as this shows have become more popular and kind of grown in budget um a lot of them are backed away from doing that those free on on air stuff yeah just basically focusing on the, the quality of the content that they're giving you so yeah. um we've got some less on -air stuff now than we have in the past but we still get a huge amount of value out of the actual yeah. materials Gary, how do you decide what opportunities to take in that case you know i see you know a tv show that's a huge opportunity and then they're probably asking you to to cut your profit margin i can see the same thing with contractors like dangling something well we do tons of houses if you just give us this deal how do you decide how do you navigate that you know it, it's taken some time to uh kind of read through the, the kind of bs from a lot of these guys um i've noticed the guys that do a lot of business like that they don't blatantly talk about it they're just like it's innate in them they're like you know give it your best deal and whatever your best deal is we work with it uh, in fact, some of our largest customers never have a problem, never have, never say a word. They, uh, you know, just love us. They don't complain about that stuff. It's usually the guys that are like really small guys trying to become big. They're like, 
we're going to give you all this business, but you got to give us this in exchange. And so we, you know, we start off, we'll say, once you hit a certain threshold, then we will do it. But until then, you're just, you know, we don't know you, you don't know us. So let's right. kind of get to know each other first. Right, it's right. like dating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with the, that's a TV front. And so what about the social media front? I know you guys do a lot of great content in social media. Uh, maybe start with YouTube for a second. Yeah, so we started, um, I mean, let's face it, there's not a lot to talk about on cabinets. Like once you talk about them, you know, yeah. It's not. <laughs> well, that's why I want you to talk about this because if you can make cabinets sexy, then no yeah. one out there has an excuse about their product. I mean, yeah, it's probably the well, least. Well, first of all, Gary, if you can ship cabinets, like someone who's doing e-commerce cabinets, yes. if you can do that. Forget it. You can do everything. So that's why I love having you for this. So yeah, well, we always joke about it. It's probably the worst product you can sell online. It's, it's big and bulky. It's you know hard to ship. It's a natural product, so it gets damaged. Like, what do you do with it when you get it? Yeah, it's like. So we we do a lot of education through video, um, and what we figured out that you know it was hard for us to keep coming up with like crazy stories to talk about cabinets. So it was like yeah. we just take all the questions that we get on a daily basis, convert them into videos, and these those become more of two tutorials than anything else yeah so we, that's great we've been trying on a regular basis to take um, all the questions our customer service gets convert them into educational videos because um, we know if one person's asking that there's probably at least a handful of other people yeah. that want the same answer um, we're turning those into videos like I said and then putting them on YouTube uh, and then uploading them onto our site so um, we've also done a lot with because it is a hard product to ship and people aren't used to dealing with it we've actually created a series of videos so that after they order we walk them through the entire process. Like unpacking stuff. Exactly what's going to happen when it gets there, if there is something wrong, what to do. And it's all in more of like a fun video aspect than just reading it off of a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So uh, YouTube was actually a big big, uh, ad, uh, big directional push for us, especially with trying to drive in some traffic and education and everything else. Well, yeah, what made you start with that? Because I look and some of these videos have like 3,000 views or more. On, on yeah, you know, it's Cabot. just... It was one of those things where we, we've tested out just about every social media platform out there. Yeah. Uh, we know which one. Yeah, so rank them. Most. What, do, what do you like most and what do you not like as much for for this? Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook because um, it's really hard to sell kitchens on there. But um, it's really easy for us to re-engage with people that have actually come to our site. Yeah. Um, so for us, Facebook isn't... Um, like Advertising campaigns don't work really well for us, but retargeting campaigns work really well. Hmm. So we've learned that over the last couple of years. Um, Pinterest, obviously, because it's a visual product, like people want to see really nice kitchens finished and everything. Uh, Pinterest works really well for us. Yeah. It's a digital marketplace. Um, there's some home improvement sites like house.com and buildzoom.com that do really well for us. Um, Google ads still work really well. Bing, for some reason, Bing converts better for us than really? any platform. Um, we got Facebook, we got YouTube, YouTube does really well. Yeah, so YouTube, I want to hear about your process. I mean, the geeky part of me wants to hear. So, you know, there's a process there that goes, a customer service, you know, takes a call, there's a question. What's the process that it actually translates? Because there's many steps until it gets put yeah. into a video so and then onto YouTube. Kind of our process is that those questions go into, our, we have a custom built CRM. So when a customer calls, uh, a customer service person will type that into kind of like a, almost like a notebook section of, within our CRM. Um, and then on a weekly basis, we'll kind of go through there and look at what could be made into a video versus what's just like a generic question. Uh, in some cases, we'll group them together into like a series of questions within a video. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a little section of our showroom that we sectioned off uh, strictly for with lighting and everything to be able to shoot um, custom videos there. Nice. So we were on a pretty good streak of creating a couple week. We've kind of fallen off that recently, but um, just because what's your favorite? Things. What's a favorite video that you favorite produce? Video? Maybe like it's a really weird question or maybe it's especially well done. Because I like checking out really good marketing videos, even if it's kitchen camera. I'll tell you which one's the best one that's, that's working for us the best right now. Yeah. Uh, it's on Facebook and it's actually, uh, it's one of the TV shows, but it was done here in Philadelphia. Um, and it was actually a buddy of ours is the contractor and it has uh, John De Silva from, he's done a couple shows on TV. But he literally blatantly gives us a promotion on the video, really, like they specifically for us, and it honestly converts better than anything that we've ever created. What does he say? He just he walks through a finished kitchen and like has the surprised homeowner come in, and they they literally like are like, "Wow, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen." And he talks about the quality and everything. So 
Uh, it gives us some social proof from him, um, but also it's such a high quality video that we can never shoot anything that well. Right, <laughs> and the customer's reaction, I'm sure, is, yeah, is huge exactly. too. Yeah, so it's uh, it's got a, it's got a mixture of like the perfect storm for us. So we use that for all of our retargeting uh, ads on YouTube. We use it for all of our Facebook campaigns and everything. So yeah, yeah. it's by far our highest converting ever. Yeah. So what works for YouTube subscribers? Because you guys still have a number of subscribers on YouTube too. Yeah. You know, it's just the uh, the educational aspect of it. So we look outside of um, just what has to do with our cabinets. So we'll talk about uh, fundamental home improvement projects and right. like general things that people would have to do around their house anyways. Right. So you can kind of pull them in from those ancillary topics that they're looking at. Then maybe they'll start to see some stuff about the video of the cabinets yeah. and talk about that stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of a guy I interviewed uh, the Beard Brand, and he's got like tens of thousands, I don't know, I forgot, 70,000 about how to take care of your beard. And like, so it really reminds me of, I go, how do you have 70,000 people yeah. like watching your videos on stroking your beard? But he does it well, so now I can add kitchen cabinet uh, videos to my yeah. repertoire. Another topic you never thought that you'd actually want to subscribe to, right? <laughs> um, so what about, you know, a lot of great tips on boosting sales. Now, what about some mistakes that people should avoid when selling uh, when, on e-commerce? Uh, I mean, honestly, the biggest mistake would be not knowing who you're actually talking to. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you can waste a ton of, ton of money. Um, the other thing that I kind of preach about and, and some of the things when I go on and I give presentations is don't focus on just one marketplace. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, obviously, on Amazon. There's mm -hmm. a lot of money you know, on your own website. But having a multi-platform strategy, yeah. it's going to protect you in the long run. Um, and I'll yeah. give you an example. So we never really got hit by any of the Google updates, um, except for one, I guess it was probably about five or six years ago. Um, we're doing really well. You know, Things were taking off. We're hiring people. We're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. But we were heavily focused on our own website. Almost all of our traffic was organically based uh, from SEO efforts that we put through. Yeah. Uh, and then one day we lost like 20% of our traffic just right. from Google. I was like in sheer panic mode. I'm like, holy, like we literally just lost 20 some percent of our business without nothing that we did. So that, from that day on, I made it's a, a scary thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, there's people that have lost all their business just right. from, like focusing on one thing. So from that day on, we made sure that we never were focused on one platform or one advertising source. So uh, right now, even our organics may be about 20 25% of our total business. Yeah. So even if we lost all of it, we still wouldn't have everything disappear. You'd just be in the same spot you were when they, they updated it. But, you know, it's a lot easier to swallow losing 20% than it is to lose 90% of your business and right. scream, you know. Especially now, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a huge warehouse here. We've got a lot of employees to think about. So, you know, we really want to make sure that we were diversified and we were protected and everything that we did. Um, so that's one of the things I preach to about other e-commerce people is like, you're going to start off on one platform, you're going to have a lot of success, but also look at other ways that you can diversify, yeah. and generate traffic from other revenue or from traffic from other sources yeah. that God forbid the worst case scenario happens that you're not completely left without a business. You don't want to get too fat and happy in other words. Right. right. So tell me about the diversification. You know, after that hit, what did you do? Because oftentimes it takes a little bit of a scare for us to take action. Oh, yeah. What did you do to diversify after that hit? I mean, our, our first thing was we were never running any paid ads. Everything was organic. We were just getting just natural traffic was great. Um, so that was our first step. Because we your background's in marketing and SEO, yeah. so you were able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So And I, I had done affiliate marketing and some of that stuff before, so I knew how to run ads. Um, I finally said, okay, it's just time to bite the bullet. Let's figure this out. So that was our first launch into something different. So we started generating paid traffic. We were figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Um, from there, we looked into some of the home improvement platforms. Like For our niche, it's a little bit different because there are sites that specifically sell just home improvement products. Mm -hmm. So we were able to look at some of those marketplaces and kind of diversify that way. Mm -hmm. um, we dove into Amazon and eBay and failed miserably at it because kitchen cabinets just do not right. sell on eBay and Amazon. On Amazon, yeah. Like, do, do people buy any components of kitchen cabinets or not at all on Amazon? Well, we spent, uh, and I, this is kind of like what our last maybe two years was, um, we spent a lot of time figuring out why they wouldn't buy and like what could we actually sell to get them back in the system. Right, right, right. So he figured out that they're not buying kitchens but they're buying like um, we do a lot with like shower doors and, and different products for the bathroom yeah. that kind of get them used to our buying cycle. So we actually have a very successful eBay and Amazon store now. We've, we probably do 70 figures on Amazon alone right yeah. now. Um, 
but that is all just to drive traffic back to our site. So we're selling other people's products that we know sell really well, mm. um, getting them in, used to buying from us and getting them used to our selling cycle, and then we're dropping them into an email campaign to get them back into the, the cabinet stuff. So it's, it's really grabbing people that weren't really shopping for cabinets, but also in the long run, if they're making one home improvement project, they're probably gonna do one or two more down the road. Yeah. So you can, can you work directly with manufacturers to sell their brands then on Amazon? Yeah, so that's what we're doing. We, uh, we focused more on manufacturers that we knew would drop ship for us. Uh, we You're like, I don't want any more warehouse headaches. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got enough stuff out here. I don't need to be bringing in other people's products. So uh, yeah, we have, we have probably about five or six vendors that we work with that will drop ship for us. We don't have to touch it. Uh, and we're just driving the traffic to the yeah. Amazon store for yeah. So what's your requirement for that? Like, does it have to be a certain size, like below a certain weight or sell for a certain price? No, there... The unique thing is that we sh we figured out the shipping process for you know, based off of how bad our product is to ship. Um, so right. we, can, we can literally deal with any product in the, in, that, that's out there. Uh, I can't think of anything worse than cabinets at this point other than maybe like a pool table or something that you'd have to ship. But... Um, Yes, yeah, so we don't have any requirements on that. We just try to make sure that, A, they ship within Amazon's uh, requirement times, um, that we know they're going to communicate effectively with us, um, and that the price point makes sense. So we're not focused on making profit off it. We're trying to get them in the lead, but we also want to make sure that we make a little bit of money off it just for the effort. Right. Now, do you only do drop shipping with that, or do you sometimes have them do FBA? No, we don't. Right now, we only do dropship um, we've been looking at doing some of our own products uh, especially now that we have like the cooking page up and some of that stuff yeah uh, we've got enough followers that we know we can start creating our own products yeah. so we're gonna do uh, a couple tripwire products like uh, I know we're looking at like some kitchen gadgets and, and different things that are at like a low, low enough low enough price point that people would you know we could sell enough of them and get some people back into the email campaigns yeah any tips, uh, Gary, with working with these manufacturers? You know, I obviously talk to p the people who sometimes that's their whole business, right? They just yeah. deal with these manufacturers, have them drop ship. Um, any um, tips when working with these manufacturers? And then I want to ask a marketing question. Uh, if you have them put anything in the box, like if there's any marketing materials so that you can capture them as a customer. Yeah, we, um, so depends on which way you're going. So if you're going straight to the factory, so for the cabinets and everything, we deal straight with the factory. Yeah. Um, in that case, you get more flexibility in terms of what you can do with the packaging and what you can put inside of it. Yeah. Um, so when we, we bring in full containers or we uh, partner up and we bring in partial containers or whatever, we have the flexibility to put stuff in the packaging and really focus on making sure our message and everything's correct for us. Um, for some of the stuff that we do on eBay and Amazon where we're just strictly drop shipping from U.S. Uh, manufacturers, uh, we don't have that flexibility, so yeah. we have to have a really good follow-up system. Yeah. The good thing is that because it is a bigger, bulky product, um, it's natural for them to get a follow-up from us. Um, you know, if you think you're getting 300-pound item showing up at your door, it's not as it's not self-explanatory. It's not it's not as weird to get a call from somebody to say, "Hey, did everything go okay?" Whereas if you know you just got a toothbrush in the mail, like you're not gonna expect somebody <laughs> to you know, call and check up on it. So. Uh, it's a little more logical in that process right. where we have a follow-up and it's not as creepy or as intrusive as it would be for... You're a friendly looking guy, you know, if they, yeah. they hear you on the, the other end. So what kind of follow-up do you recommend? What should people uh, best uh, practice us, start doing? We'll send obviously the, the email through um, through Amazon or eBay or whatever the platform is. Uh, I know there's software programs that you can use to automate some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we go more with a manual approach just so that we have a different person on there and I really communicate with them. We also do a phone call follow-up, um, especially since most of the products that we ship require an appointment for the delivery. Um, it allows us the opportunity to call and say, hey, we know your shipment's going to be delivered in tomorrow or whatever. We just want to make sure if you have any issues, here's who you can reach out to. Yeah. Uh, and it starts that communication process for us. Um, so in that case, we just do a manual follow-up on the phone, yeah. uh, just to touch base with them and, and really keep create those uh, communication channels. Now, Gary, will you, again, this is another geeky marketing question, but will you um, leave a message about that or will you wait to get someone on the line to talk to no, them? No, we'll leave a message. Well, because no. okay. a lot of times they're expecting somebody to call to set up the appointment. Okay. Um, so it's, a, it's almost a natural progression for them to call somebody back. Yeah. So and do you a, tell them the call back or you just give them the information on the message? We just give them the information and say, here's who's here, who you can reach out to if you have any issues or anything like that. And then oftentimes we'll do a follow-up after it's delivered um, because usually you know, in a construction project, they may not open it for a couple days. Yeah. So we want to make sure that they get within the parameters of when we can file a yeah. claim. For this one. Yeah. So. I guess you know my brain goes directly to 
really hard parts or nightmares. Like so, things that pop up for me is like logistical nightmares. Like for you, yes. I don't know how you deal with it. And then the other thing is hiring. You, you have to have a lot of people to coordinate with between the yeah, people. So we, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I get back to the logistics one. So I actually, my background was logistics. I came from, uh, I worked in logistics for about 10 years. Um, I was the director of sales for a logistics company. Mm. Started anything. So I knew the shipping and, and logistics industry inside out. That helped a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so I, I, I was able to get some like super aggressive rates with our with the trucking companies. I knew who was good to service what areas and whatnot. Uh, I knew the kind of claims ratio and I knew how to handle a claim. So a lot of times we would, preemptively try to explain that to customers so we didn't have to deal with a huge headache on the back end. Yeah. Um, but we've also, in that process, developed, uh, when we were talking about software programs, some of the stuff that we developed was internal to help solve those issues. So it's, um, you know, a good example is we created a mobile app. Um, so we take a picture of the product before it leaves our facility. And then when it gets to the customer, they can use the same mobile app to take a picture of it when it gets there. So we're mm. kind of eliminating the, the steps in between of arguing between the carrier of, oh, it didn't show up that way or whatever. Um, and it helps the customer out because they have this like comfort level with what's showing up and what it should look like. Right. So we develop different things like that to help. That's pretty cool. Logistics nightmare that typically happens. Yeah. So I want you to talk a, about some of the in-house software you're developing that maybe you'll let people use, maybe not in the future. Yeah. Um, but talk about logistics for a second. Um, um, what are big mistakes? Like if you didn't know what you knew, what mistakes did you see people making when you were at the logistics or you know with your company? Um, that's a good question. Um, logistically, a lot of people, especially since ours is like a big bulky product, it kind of, it's outside the norm of what most people would deal with. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people don't understand the, how to ship it or they don't know what, what to expect. I mean, we're putting it on a third party trucking company who's showing up with a lift gate on their truck and it's, you know, could be a thousand pounds, could be 2000 pounds showing up somebody's house. Right. Um, so I think that was actually the barrier to entry for a lot of our competition, as yeah. they just didn't understand how to actually ship all this stuff. Right. So I, really, I think that's what helped us really grow fast, because we were doing something that's different than everybody else, and I didn't have the expertise in it. Um, in terms of shipping normal products, dealing with like FedEx and UPS and some of that stuff, um, I don't know that there's major mistakes that people make. It's just um, maybe just not understanding the cost of shipping before they're factoring in their, their pricing models. Um, I've seen that before where people will have a product on Amazon, they'll get a really good price point on it, but they'll underprice it because they won't understand what the shipping costs are. Yeah. So initially they'll end up losing money or they'll, they couldn't figure out like where their numbers are. Um, not knowing their cost per acquisition and everything is really what ends up killing a lot of people. So that would probably be my biggest thing is if, I, if I've seen people make mistakes, it's not, not knowing their true cost of goods before they actually price it they would actually end up underpricing what they should be. That makes sense. And um, what's a logistical nightmare you had to go through that would scare most people to get um, into the cabinet business? Uh, it's on a weekly basis. I'm shocked. By what really? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the biggest logistical nightmare that I can remember was uh, it actually happened with a TV show. So we were shipping it, shipping an entire kitchen to a TV show, um, and there was a blizzard halfway across the country in like Chicago or something like that. That's where so I it, am. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. It got, you know, it's on a truck. A truck can't go across the highway if there's a blizzard coming through. So it got stuck there. Uh, TV show didn't really care why it got stuck or how it got stuck. They just knew that their production time was going to run out and they were going to have to pay overtime and all that stuff. So we literally had to fly an entire kitchen cross country to really an astronomical fee. But yeah, but we got accomplished. We got the TV show there, what wow. they needed and everything. So. Um, it's just knowing to now how to have, how to navigate if something does go wrong. Um, that was it was a good thing that I knew what I knew because I, otherwise somebody would have just panicked and had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> they just keel over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we just, they just grabbed like a bottle of vodka and just started checking. So That's why you started Wine Trail Adventures. <laughs> um, so what does that call uh, look like? Is someone screaming at you on the other line? Like what is? No, it's more oh. uh, panic in their voice, and they're like, well, could they, they were literally looking for a solution. Like, they knew it wasn't our fault. Obviously, we can't control that. Yeah. Um, and they were running behind when they ordered. So it was literally just them, like, what do we do? Like, who solves this? So we just took it upon ourselves to figure out, you know, what the solution was going to be. But yeah, it wasn't like an angry call or anything. It was more like, right. we're in a lot of trouble here. So. <laughs> right. 
now I know your customer avatar for Wine Trail Adventures. It's all people who own cabinets, yes. uh, yeah. cabinet stores. People that own businesses that are about to have a heart attack. That's who our customers are. So on the marketing company side of things, Gary, so talk about some of the, the tools that you created. Yeah, so we, um, as I like I mentioned, one was a mobile app. Um, and we started the marketing company based off of some of the problems that we were having within the cabinet company. Yeah. It was like, you know, we couldn't find software that fit it. Right. And we're like, well, if we can't find it, why don't we just create it? That's and, why I'm really interested to hear about this. That's my sponsor, Scubana, is the same thing, big seller. And yeah. he wanted to, they were using all these internal automations to ship things and wanted to put it all under one e-commerce thing. So yeah, so what kind of stuff... So the, the one was a mobile app that we created to help kind of ease the claims process. Um, one, um, so the logistical, another logistical challenge with shipping on an LTL carrier is all the paperwork that's involved. It's yeah. not like just print out a label and go. There's bills of lading and like all these other fancy documents that you need. So we were doing it basically manually, which was costing us, I don't know, maybe seven, eight minutes a, a document. Yeah. So I'm like, why don't we automate this? We actually created an automation system that took the sales order information, dumped it in here. Uh, into the actual paperwork, and then we only had to enter two or three lines and we were done. So it was cutting it down like a 10, se- ten second process. That's so huge, it's, yeah. It's a minute process. Um, so we did that, and we created it as an app that can attach to just about any shopping cart plugin uh, as a plugin. So that's actually done. We've been using it internally, and we're actually getting ready to, to push that out. To so what do you what do you call it? Uh, can people get it yet or no? Yeah, it's gonna be. It's just like. Uh, Bill Lading app or Bill Lading Creator or something like that is what we're calling it. I mean, can people use it besides people in your company or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not live yet as a plugin, but we're actually getting ready to, to separate it and, and push it out to the marketplace. So, yeah. So, what's the name or where, where can people find it? Um, I don't have it ready available yet online, but it'll be called like the Bill Lading app or Bill Lading Creator. Uh, okay. It'll be a plugin for like uh, one shopping cart and some of those other solutions out there. Um, some of the other stuff that we created. So, we as I mentioned, we diversified onto multiple marketplaces. We yeah. had data feeds for every single marketplace that we were using. Um, so internally, we created our own data feed program that centralized that all down to one data feed, redistributed it out to all the play, all the marketplaces, and then pulled all their information back in. So we're spinning off our own data feed automation system. Mm-hmm. Um, we work with eBay and Amazon. Uh, that's actually in beta right now, so it should be ready to go hopefully within the next two weeks, provided they don't have any major hiccups. Um, so talk about the pain point on that for a second. What were you experiencing in the company that made you create this internally? Uh, and like what other solutions were not out there? Yeah, we looked at a couple that were out there and they just didn't have the depth of uh, diversity that we needed or the, the information that we can get back. Um, so what we really went out and we were like, you know, we're creating every time we add new products because an average cap- kitchen line for us has... I think 200 some SKUs on it. So every time we add a cabin line, that's 200 some more SKUs that we have to send out to 18 different sites. And you know, you think about that—that's a little, I don't know, maybe an hour's worth of work, two hours worth of work for every time you do that. Yeah. For us, it was like, how do we streamline this so that we only have to update it once and it pushes out to everybody? Um, we looked at a couple of the data feed systems that were out there, and they just weren't offering the what we needed in terms of depth of descriptions and everything else that we do to kind of optimize them. Uh, so we're like, okay. If, if it's not out there, we'll just create this. Um, so we're a big proponent of trying to solve our own problems rather than right. trying to um, find something that fits it. Um, so we created that. Um, it helps us pull in all of our data information too, especially from sales, so we can keep track of it in one uh, CRM instead of having multiple platforms to look at and, and spreadsheets and all that stuff. Um, so that's really what, what the whole thing was created for. Was What's just, the avatar for that? Like, what Who should be using it? Um, I think... It's really geared towards people that are on or that have successful uh, businesses like, like on Amazon that are looking to diversify and try to like shift focus not away from Amazon but just to at least get on other places and have additional traffic. Mm-hmm. So it'd be really easy to take that data feed that you already created for Amazon and then just dump it in and allow it to automate it for everything else and give you one central platform to, to focus on. I mean, is there a uh, the company that you know it doesn't make sense unless you have over X number of products or something? What? Yeah, it's kind of what we're looking at for beta testing here to see. You know what type of customer it actually fits. I mean, it obviously fits our model, but yeah. a lot of the, most of those guys are going to be. So um, we're through beta. We're trying to pick people that are at multiple multiple levels of business. And yeah. See which one it really works for, and which one maybe it just doesn't yeah. apply to. You have to look at the Cuban e-commerce mastery series. You may have some beta testers there. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what else? I, I do want to touch on after we you talk about all these. 
you've become like a, it's like a whole different business, which is really interesting. And there's a whole set of, you know, advantages and dis, you know, and problems too that come yeah. with software development. But, yes. um, but, the but other what's one, another, the yeah. Other ones that we're doing, um, so as I mentioned, it's a very visual industry where, you know, pictures really help sell the product. Yeah. Um, so for us, every time we get like a testimonial or something from a customer with pictures, we post it on obviously Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, all these different platforms, but we're doing it manually. So we actually created a program, uh, it's called Viral Content Automation, which allows us to, uh, especially for our contract, so we built it internally for our contractor. So a contractor can buy our kitchen, install it, take pictures of it, um, upload it into our site, and then we do all the automation for them. We'll put it on their you know, Yahoo page, on their Google local page, like all the other business pages uh, mm -hmm. can be automated and then also all their social media pages. So it really created like a marketing platform for us mm -hmm. to get to them. Um, and it's been working really well internally. So we're like, why not, you know, any other companies like real estate companies or uh, construction company, any, anything that's on the visual aspect in terms of sales, why not let them use it? So we're creating that. Um, that's also in beta actually this month. Um, and we're hoping to have that out on the marketplace next month as well. What do you find works well with that? Like, um, what's been a success story from that, um, from a use? Like, I'm thinking, well, does a contractor take a picture and then it's on their Facebook and someone, they get business from Facebook? Or what, what does that best yeah, case so scenario look like? Especially for contractors, um, we know of a couple that have gotten quite a few projects out of it. It's simply, um, it's getting the visibility in places that they normally wouldn't use. So mm -hmm. for, especially for a contractor, like they don't have time to do marketing, they don't have time to do so, a lot of They're that stuff. They're not on Pinterest all day, yeah. no. Right, so they can, I mean, they can, they can literally just create the account and we'll do it for them. So a lot of it's just getting visibility out there for them where they normally wouldn't be able to. Um, and if they're doing really good projects or really good work, then it's just gonna you know, speak for itself. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the home improvement sites, they by us helping them create accounts and get them get everything set up for them, that's really helped launch their businesses and then obviously helps us in the long run too. Yeah, so Gary, the trials and tribulations of a software company now. Uh, now that you've, like, uh, have logistical nightmares, now you add yeah. development and other stuff, um, so. I can tell you, whatever your timeline is and your budget for a software program, just assume it's going to be nowhere near that. <laughs> What's been the hardest part about the development? Um, with those two projects, I actually had a really good development team that, that I've worked with well um, on the project that's behind you, the Wine Trail Adventures, yeah. that, um, that's been like a, if I could make any mistakes, I've made them with that. I mean, just. Like what? We, you know, we. Well, I guess what uh, is Wine Trail Adventures first? For Bill okay, Dono? so, yeah, so Wine Trail Adventures was, um, it's the third company that we have, but it's based off of wine tasting and, you know, just exploring different wineries. So, yeah. every winery in the U.S. is loaded in there. Uh, you can go in, you can check in, you can review, you can do all that fun stuff, like social sharing. Um, but you'll gain points for each time you check in, every time you review something. Then at the end of, you know, once you get X number of points, we'll actually send you what your top wines were. So it's basically a way to keep oh, track really? of what you've liked, how, you know, where you liked it, and then over the course of time, eventually you'll actually get those wines for free. Um, on the back end, it's a marketing platform for the wineries because, again, wineries are horrible at marketing because they just know how to make wine. They don't really know how to do anything else. Yeah. So this kind of streamlines that. They'll be able to take those reviews from customers. They'll be able to push that out to their social media platforms. Mm. Uh, they'll be able to retarget those customers. They'll be able to run advertising specifically to people that they know have been in there. Um, so it's really a marketing platform for okay. the companies, but also a mobile app for users okay. for free. Um, so but with that program, uh, you know, I didn't go overseas. I made sure that I want to have a U.S. coder um, because of the just nuances with the geographic locations and everything. Um, and it's we were on our third de development team because they just they either under budgeted or they overestimated what their workload would be. And I think that's just been the biggest issue. It's like, you know, as much as we try to communicate what we want done, there's that gap between what their interpretation is of it and what your interpretation is of it. And uh, I think we finally got the right development team now, but it's just that's probably been the biggest struggle is bridging that gap between what's in your head versus what they're actually interpreting it to be. Right. Um, and no matter how much we put on paper and I got pretty mm -hmm. thorough when it comes to that. Like I, I did a stand, uh, you know, an SOP. I put together examples of what I wanted to see in it. And, um, there was just somewhere along the line. There was just like a gap in yeah. what they really thought they could accomplish versus what was actually required. Um, yeah. so that's, that's been the biggest struggle. Okay. Yeah. I think I have a contact for you as far as that goes. So I'll, awesome. to, I'll to mention that afterwards. And, um, so why start wine trail adventures? What made you start that? 
it, it started out as a hobby, actually. Um, you know, just being an entrepreneur, just like I'm sure a lot of people listen to this. It's like you're, you're like you know what we were doing was we were driving around the country or wherever we're at. You know, we'd always look for something fun to do within every city or wherever we're at. So we're like wine tasting just became a natural thing. It was like we enjoyed it. Go out tasting. Because you're in Pennsylvania, are there yeah. like wineries near you? Where do you go? Yeah, there's actually. Yeah. Um, I forget the exact stat, but I think there's like 300 wineries in Pennsylvania or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, there's really a lot. It's not maybe not what everybody would really like, um, yeah. but there are quite a few wineries. So like just going up nine, up and down 95, like you know, you get stuck in traffic. You're like, oh, we, maybe we can just pull off, find a winery or something like that. So at the time, there really wasn't anything that could kind of sync everything together. So I was, I was like, okay, if there's nothing out there, I'll, I'll just create something. Like you know, <laughs> we know how to do this. Let's let's launch our own product. Um, it's the uh, was, advantage was, and disadvantage of being an entrepreneur then yeah, you, like yeah everything becomes an opportunity for you it's like <laughs> it's like why don't i just make it myself <laughs> so for the um software programs yeah. uh, if people want to look out for them yes um once they do come out what what are each of them called just so people can um you can go to uh data feed automate automation.com and there's actually a landing page uh, a beta test landing page for that mm-hmm. uh the other one is viral content systems.com mm-hmm. Uh, and that should have a beta testing land page, landing page already as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, fully built sites for both of them. Um, the mobile apps, um, the, te- the one that we'd use for claims is actually out there. It's called Tank to Order. Uh, it's free for everybody to use. Um, we customize it for you if you really want to like white label it or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other two apps are not to the marketplace yet, but we're, we're getting them out there as fast as we can. Yeah. So I want you to speak to hiring for a second. You know, some people. Um, picture e-commerce, you're sitting on the couch and you're just at so your computer. Yes. And then what's the reality, Jerry? The reality is much further from that. <laughs> um, I think ours is a little bit different than most e-commerce companies because, um, again, because of the physical nature of the product and how big and bulky it is, uh, we ultimately had to get a building. Um, there's a lot of companies that you know you can do FBA through Amazon and never have to touch the product. Yeah. There's a lot of ways around it, but because of the nature of our product, we had to get a building. So that went back, I would say maybe seven years ago, we ended up getting our first warehouse. Um, at that time, I was palletizing every order. I was doing everything. Um, as we slowly kept growing, we were hiring more people, hiring more people. Um, so tell me, palletizing, what does that mean to people? Okay, so that's just taking... Break it down. Like, you're yeah, two so in you're the morning, taking, what are you you're doing? You're taking an entire kitchen. Um, let's say there's maybe 40 boxes, big boxes. It would be strategically placing them on a pallet or a skid, figuring out how to square it off, make sure that they're not going to get damaged, um, shrink wrapping them, strapping them, doing all that fun serious. stuff. Serious. That's serious labor, yeah. So we were doing all that initially. Then you know, as we got a new where- as we got a warehouse, we started bringing on people to do the warehousing stuff for us. Um, brought in our own customer service team because uh, because of the nature of the product. Again, it's it's hard to outsource that. Um, yeah. It's just nuances that you you really need to be in the building to actually check on. Um, so we brought in kitchen design people. Um, so I think right now we're up to, I think we have 15 in-house. Uh, I've got a team in the Philippines. I've got like four or five people in the Philippines, uh, three in India, and we've got two guys uh, outsourced outside here in New York City. So They do more data, like Philippines and India, do they more data related or what do they uh, do? The Philippines does um, more of the task oriented stuff. So like we really broke down um, each task in the like, standard operating procedure. So one is for like social media. We have one that, you know, we'll give them the content they post on a regular basis. They make sure that there's communication going on. Uh, another one is graphic design. So anytime we need images or banners, uh, we have one, somebody dedicated to that. Um, we have one person that manages eBay and Amazon for us, just so that we make sure that orders are getting out on time. Communication is proper. Yeah. You know, everything that we need to do on that. So yeah. those are more like the, the day-to-day tasks, things that we can outsource to them. Yeah. India is actually so we within our, our website we created uh, a custom kitchen design tool that was that's embedded into our site. You know mm-hmm. the average homeowner can use and kind of manipulate. The guys in it's India. It's a good looking site. People should check out rtacabinetstore.com. Really good looking site. Yeah, we split test pages on a daily I basis. I could tell that you. Yeah, I mean, because you have the. Um, we'll talk about some of the conversion, like why you have certain things. I mean, I immediately see the. Um, the credibility, you know, with all the TV shows yeah. there. Like, what else? What other components should people be included? Uh, in? You know, we we've split test a lot of things. In fact, I was, the last split test I was kind of surprised about. So we went with a really clean design 
on the website as a split test because the one there is it's a little bit cluttered, but yet you know it still gets the job done. Yeah. And when we tested a really clean design, it actually converted lower than the one that we currently have. Mm, interesting. So we just automatically assume that oh everybody's going to clean design, it's going to work out really well. But yeah. uh, that's why it's really important to actually split test some stuff. Right. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Yeah, They're I just don't, used I don't know. to it or something. I couldn't. I can't figure out the logic on it. Really. Um, I mean, it's it's. I wish there was like a standard that you could say, okay, the color green works better every time or the color orange. Right. Really, every business, it's going to be different. Right. Um, so we've tested colors. We've tested just locations and buttons. And everything we change has some sort of dynamic effect on, on the yeah. site. So it's, uh, you know, it's why we just keep testing every day. Yeah. We try something different. What, were, what produced the biggest lift for you? Biggest lift would be um, probably the kitchen design tool. Um, when we actually integrated that, so we used to have it as a separate platform. But yeah. If people check it out, it's like right in the middle of the site. It's like custom kitchen layout tool. Yeah. They can check it out. Yeah. Um, that boosted our conversion rate significantly. Wow. So, um, How? What made you even think to do that? You know, we were just. We're I wouldn't be like, hmm. Let's put a custom kitchen layout tool in the middle of our site. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things like you're you're constantly looking for ways to diversify yourself or at least become stand out from the crowd and. Yeah. We started getting a lot of competition that were literally just slapping up websites and copying what we we're doing. So we're like, well, we know that nobody has the wherewithal to actually build their own software program. Mm -hmm. So let's just build something that we know will actually ease the sales process. Because um, you know, let's face it, you're buying a kitchen; it can be an overwhelming process. You're spending a lot of money. Yeah. People don't really know how to fit things together. So yeah. that you could a whole, somebody with no knowledge can literally just drop cabinets yeah. into a layout and figure it out themselves. Yeah. So it really helped us with the sales process, but it yeah. also diversified or it gave us something different um, that our competition didn't have. Yeah. So one thing you look at some some you know I guess something people can think about is maybe what the biggest pain point is of your customer, and then yeah. make it easier. And probably that if it's pain point for your customer, it's probably a pain point for you dealing with and explaining yes. it, and that makes it easier on both sides of, of the coin. Yes. Yeah, so what we and kind of going back to you were asking like what was the biggest change that we made to the site yeah. one, actually now that I think about it one of the biggest was probably we looked at not only the avatar of our customers but also the skill level um, so we have essentially three different funnels that people can go through they, if you have zero knowledge and you just want a good deal uh, you're going to need a lot of hand holding so we have kitchen design staff on hand, on hand that can kind of take you through the process they'll actually design it for you yeah. um, for somebody that has enough knowledge to be dangerous but they don't trust their knowledge they can go through the kitchen design tool, and they can actually That's do it most themselves. people, yeah. <laughs> but you know, and check their process, and then for the people that are experts, like you know, contractors or whatever, that just want to buy, they can go through a much more clean uh, checkout process. So the, by di diversifying that, you will eliminate the contractors who are like, God, I don't want to go through this like huge process. And then for the people that didn't know, it gave them that comfort level that they were working with somebody else to be able to fix the problems that they had. Yeah. yeah. So it's, that was another big thing that really changed when we created those three separate uh, funnels to go through. Yeah. yeah. I, see, Gary, I love going to sites by people like you because I know you pay attention to detail and I know that you really know your customer and I know you know marketing. So I love looking at your site just to see... <laughs> what you have on there and I, I suggest people check it out because you know you, one thing I know is obviously right away is the credibility statements the phone number is top and center it just reminds me of what I'm probably not doing a lot of times you know I go to this you have like beautiful pictures there you have uh, an opt-in with like a really value a value proposition uh, download um, and then you have this awesome custom tool um, but just a few things like right off the bat top of the fold are are all front and yeah. center that reminds me of what I should be doing and it's interesting, even just taking the phone number, like we used to have it like all the way to the right, and by shifting it to the center, it actually helped increase, increase conversions because it was front and center for mm. people, the trust factor. So yeah. They may not have seen it, and they're like, oh, it's just another website, but it, by putting that it's front right center, in front of them. Some credit, yeah, I credit. love that. Yeah. So I knew there's a rhyme and a reason why you do things. <laughs> um, and so the hiring, hiring process. So, you know, with that, how do you know when to hire? I mean, do you bootstrap or do you have to get outside? investment for this because these are no, expensive never, never the outside investment wow that's impressive yeah everything's been uh it's really impressive um i think it started with like five thousand dollars or something like that on that's my house. unbelievable so when it comes to hiring yeah um, i'm not going to say that i'm the best at it because um it's a challenge it certainly is a challenge especially for our product mix because um what i've found is that somebody that's really good at customer service may not 
understanding the technicalities that go into cabinets or, or, or installing them. Different skill set, yeah. Struck, struggle with that. Um, be it somebody that has a really good skill set, may not have the personality to be in customer service. Ideally, you'd want someone cross-trained to do both. Yeah, so it's, um, I've always struggled with finding that mix and finding who really fits in. Yeah. Uh, I think we've gotten a little bit better at it over the years, um, but it's a challenge. It's not, uh, it's not easy. Nothing about this business has been easy, but <laughs> that in particular, the hiring process has been quite a challenge. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting, I think, is what you do is, first of all, hiring in general, right? So when do you, how did you decide to bring on certain positions as you, as you grew? Yes, what we've really, um, in the beginning, I probably struggled with that. Uh, as any entrepreneur, you want to do everything yourself. Right. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a business coach who really helped me focus on how to kind of split up those tasks and figure out which ones I should be doing versus what I should yeah. be outsourcing and what I should be pushing to it. Uh, yeah. Manage. That really opened up a lot in my head. Like, okay, I don't have to do all this stuff. I can, you know, when you when you look at the value that you're bringing for each of the tasks that you're doing, and you realize that you know a ten dollar task should be done by somebody other than yourself when yeah. you're the big level guy. Yeah. What surprised you from their advice? What did you decide to figure that you would definitely be doing that you had to hand off? I'd say a lot of it's been like the operational stuff. So uh, I brought on an operations manager now who kind of sees the day to day stuff and allows me to focus on what I'm good at, which is the marketing and, and the financing side of it. Mm -hmm. um, once I did that, uh, I'm still kind of in that transition period out of that, but now that I've done that, it's freed up a lot of my time to focus on big level thinking and bringing on like programs that are going to help double or triple the company over the next couple of years. Um, yeah. But until then, I was still interacting with the warehouse. I was doing a lot of the things that kind of were distracting me from everything that I should be doing. Um, but once I really sat down and like defined what those tasks were and how I should pass them off, it made things a lot easier for me. Yeah. So what other great advice did you get from your business coach? Uh, time management skills. Uh, I've always been pretty good at time management, but again, it came down to segmenting things and like well, grouping them into like tasks. So, especially with multiple businesses, you know, to hop around from like marketing on one to operations on another, and it, it was just so disjointed. Um, I started focusing on okay, well, this day we're going to do all the marketing across all the all the sites or all mm. the different businesses. You kind of batch it. Yeah, so that way I was I was always in the marketing mind instead of like jumping. Mm financing to operations to whatever uh, and that really helped me fade, stay focused on the tasks that I was doing instead of like, getting distracted by other stuff mm -hmm. uh, so like kind of batching tasks based off of what the task is versus what the actual business was um, and then obviously outsourcing or, or, bring, or delegating some of the tasks down to uh, lower level stuff yeah and Gary one thing you, you talked about is like as an entrepreneur sometimes we try and do everything ourselves so there's one thing the business coach tells you you need an operations manager another thing you actually getting one so what did that process look like internally from knowing it and actually executing on it? Um, once I looked at everything, I'm, like, it's one of those things like you know that, you, at least I did, I knew right. it, it and I'm just like, for some reason I'm like, no, I can just keep doing it myself. Like, I, I'm good at it. I, I can do it. Um, so That's like, what I mean. That's what I mean. Outside right. person, like, you're stupid for doing this. Like, why are you not, like, you're actually holding yourself back. Yeah. Time. I want to hear the devil and the angel that is on your shoulder and having that conversation it's tough because you get used to, uh, not that you, you don't want to let go of control, but um, you almost feel like you're not going to know what's going on day to day if you, mm -hmm. if you kind of like release some of that uh, that responsibility. Um, but in reality, it's it's really giving you time to focus on what your core set is. Like, I, I know I'm not good at managing a warehouse. Why am I doing it? I'm just doing it out of force of habit. Right. Um, so by passing that off, it allows me to focus more on the, the marketing side of it, which is what I'm really good at. So like when you think about it logically and I sat down I was like yeah you're like instead of focusing everything on what I'm good at I'm trying to do a little of everything and I'm not doing anything really well so that was kind of the mind shift for me mm -hmm. when, I, when I finally looked at it and saw what I was doing um, in terms of the process of actually going out and doing it yeah. um, I worked with him and, and a couple other people on defining what the, the actual tasks were because mm -hmm. you can't really hire somebody until you know what the core right. responsibilities are going to be yeah. so once we outlined that I actually had somebody internally that had been with me from the beginning and I was like you know what you've got almost all the skill sets so they were already trained you didn't have to bring someone in from outside I got you okay that makes it a lot easier yeah because <laughs> then you're thinking forget it now I have to train someone for yeah six months so, so they were right they, under your nose yeah so it was like just you know trying to also raise people that are internally uh, by giving them different skill sets and helping them to bring them up within the company yeah so what about, um, what other mistakes do you see other people making? 
with their e-commerce business? Oh, boy. Because um, you're doing a lot of marketing for different companies, too. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've done consulting for other businesses. Um, you know, like, I mean, what should we all not be doing, Gary? Tell me. The big ones are not knowing um, your your overall cost. What what is it, What's your fundamental cost for making it? Um, whatever the product is, you have to incorporate everything and really look at the finances. Be like, okay, did yeah. I include all the shipping costs? Did I include the labor here? Uh, know all your soft costs that are associated with the product. Because mm-hmm. uh, too many people will overlook those, and then when at the end of the day, they're like, why am I losing money, or why am I just breaking even? Um, the other huge mistake that I see is not knowing the lifetime value of your customer. Um, I'm a huge proponent of that, and I, if you look at some of the IM guys and some of the really good people that are out there like making a lot of money, mm-hmm. they don't focus on the value of the initial purchase. They look at the lifetime value of that customer. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be double, triple, whatever your actual sales price is. So if you're really only focused on that initial transaction, it's going to be really hard to make money if you're not looking at the big picture. Um, so a lot. That's where I see a lot of people make mistakes. They're so worried about, oh, I'm only making five dollars on an initial transaction. But you could be making $150 on the back end, uh, and if you're not really focused on that, then you're losing out on a whole lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talk about funnel in that in that sense, right? So they start in one part. So can you talk a little bit about the the process that someone may go through from like a free download, design ideas, or buyer's guide to whatever the largest ticket item? Yeah. So our, so our kind of sales cycle, um, depending on which funnel they come through. Um, Essentially, so we'll start with the download. So they'll, they'll come in, they'll download the free uh, design tool or design guide, which will help them kind of figure out what direction they want to go in and help yeah. them kind of sketch out their design. Throughout that process, then we'll try to push them into some of the other stuff, like either using the design tool or um, talking to one of our kitchen designers. So we always try to push them up the ladder to either get in front of somebody or get them on the phone. Um, once we get them into that process, we start really focusing on you know how do we get them up to a total price. Let's get them into a quote. Uh, once we get them in a quote, we start doing some remarketing and retargeting. Like, hey, we saw that you put this into a cart. You know, how, how do we get that transaction completed? What, what do we have to go through? Is it, you know, is there a time difference? Um, one of the things with our product that's unique is that we somebody may come to our site and purchase today, or they may not purchase for nine months. So we have a really long window between our our buying cycle. Right. So you have to keep in front of them and just keep reminding them that, like, hey, you know really like those cabinets like you know what do we need to do and it's really a soft sell we don't try to be pushy um but we just keep trying to up them up they know they want to redo it it's just a matter of when (laughs) trust me my wife and i had this conversation yesterday she's you know we try to add as much personality into it as we can Um, right yeah how do you add personality into it do you add your personality or is it like someone who does more of the videos or social media. What what personality do you infuse in there? Well, the email campaigns are sort of my personality. So I sat down with a uh, an email writer who was uh, again again not my skill set. So I like I, I know enough to be dangerous about writing email, but I obviously don't really am not an expert at it. So yeah. uh, I hired somebody to do it, and they took my personality and tried to transfer it into the actual email writing. Yeah. And like, do you want to give them a plug or or no? Uh, they're very expensive, so. Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know if they're actually. I don't even know if they're doing it anymore. Okay. Like, it's an investment, though, right? It's yeah. It's definitely an investment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the emails are written based off of my personality. Uh, the videos actually incorporate both my personality and another guy in the office, who actually is my operations manager now. He does a lot of the videos for us, so it's kind of his uh, his personality into it. Um, advertising and everything is really about me. It's like we try to be a little sarcastic, a little humor in it. Yeah created a, fic- a fictitious disease around kitchen cabinets. What is it? Uh, kitchen embarrassment syndrome. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, we created a whole organization. Yeah, like, That's uh, a great creative solution for anyone. They should create a disease around it. I, exactly. So, you know, you could, we have a ribbon. How did you come up with that? Like, yeah, you know, we sat here the one day and like, we're just tossing around like ridiculous, like what's the craziest thing that we could do about kitchen cabinets? What's the we- weirdest commercial that we've ever seen? We just started tossing around ideas, and we're like, "Why don't we just create like this fake disease? Like, you know, give it some crazy initials and pull this like some fake doctors." <laughs> and run it. Like, Have someone running through the field. They take yeah. this purple pill, and then they get this kitchen cabinet. Right. That's like you know talking about you know. Do you have these? We give a whole bunch of symptoms of what a, you know. What That's like great. And, and everything. So if we turned it into like just something funny that had nothing to do with selling. And the farther we can push away from selling, the better our conversions are. So if we can add humor to it and like. Not even mention that we're selling cabinets. 
it actually works out in the end for us. So, yeah, yeah. It's a good tip for anybody that's like has a hard product to sell, try not selling it. Do the complete opposite and just like. <laughs> it's like a Seinfeld episode, probably. Um, so, Gary, what's been the biggest? What was the biggest challenge in the beginning, very beginning, and then compared to now? Uh, biggest challenge in the beginning was, uh, I would say, just getting sales. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't know anything about kitchens when I started it. Like I didn't have a passion for yeah. it. So how'd you get into it? Um, so I had a I had a business partner in a previous business whose uncle was importing cabinets, and I actually literally just approached him and I was like, "Hey, let me create a website for you." He didn't have any presence. Um, he's like, "They'll never sell online." He's like, "I don't want anything to do with it." You know, if you want to do it, go right ahead. So that was more of a challenge than anything else. Yeah. Um, so from there, it was. Obviously, I didn't have a passion for it, so it was really just me writing about factual stuff and doing the fundamental marketing things to get it going. You saw an opportunity there. What did you see that most people didn't at that time? Yeah, so it was, it's kind of, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was looking at kind of the fundamentals that they look at when you're looking at the Amazon products and anything else. It was uh, an antiquated niche that had competition, but the competition didn't really know what they were doing. Yeah. And it was a marketplace that had fairly decent margins. Uh, it was easy for us to get some traction in it based off of Google rankings and everything. Uh, so it was really the perfect storm at the time. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize that I knew I knew that the industry was a little antiquated, but I didn't know what I was doing was actually kind of the groundwork for what everybody else was doing in other niches. Um, and that was kind of it. It was like you know people had websites, but they didn't have like you could see cabinets, but you had to call somebody to talk to them about it. Like you couldn't buy online. Right. So we just tried to create like an easy, simple shopping solution for them that they can just buy right there. Mm-hmm. And so, getting sales initially was the the challenge. What about now? Now it's staying ahead of the competition because literally everything that we do gets duplicated. So it's like, how do we continue to expand and, and continue yeah. to market without constantly have like every week creating new ads and doing all that stuff? So a lot of it is kind of I let the secret out when I told you about some of our social media platforms. But it's like creating ancillary markets around it. That we're not directly competing for. Kitchen. They still have to go out and get seventy thousand Facebook <laughs> Facebook fans. Which is, if anyone's tried to do that, it's, it's not that easy. So, I think you have some barrier to entry there. But yeah, no, I think so too. But yeah, uh, but yeah, it was just kind of like creating those ancillary markets around it, and then you know allowing those markets to help us grow our actual business. So it's you know, constantly building the circle out around the main business, and then just dumping that traffic back into that. Uh, that's kind of our our biggest challenge right now is just how do we keep this thing growing at the pace it's growing and keep finding those new marketplaces to service. How do you segment your day or your week? Because obviously you have so many businesses that you're running. You know, what what does your week look like? Um, I don't know that there's ever like a standard week for me, but yeah. um, I'd say, you know, the first two days we focus mostly on uh, helping operations and, and anything I need to do on that end. Uh, middle of the week is usually like marketing and conference calls and you know figuring out because we have outsourced marketing teams that we work with in terms of advertising and everything so we set up a bunch of conference calls with them figuring out what's our next strategy sales opportunities that we may, might be overlooking um, and then I focus more, more on the end of the week towards some of the other uh, opportunities so it's uh, you know the software development um, any coaching that we're doing yeah. like that. so I, I'd say that's probably like the standard week but everything's because yeah. I could see you sleeping from four to six a.m. Because you have to be up with people in India and the Philippines. Like, what's your what's your sleep schedule look like? Uh, no, I actually have a fairly normal sleep schedule. Oh. Uh, when it comes to those guys, we have them pretty regimented on email campaigns. Okay. Um, so we focus mostly on let's communicate by email. If we really have to clarify something, then we'll get on a phone call. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually have a project manager now that that kind of oversees those guys, um, so I don't have to be directly involved with them. Right. Um, really been able to separate myself and focus more on the high level stuff with that stuff than actually do like the day-to-day calls and everything. Yeah, yeah. So Gary, besides your in-house software, what other softwares do you use that's essential to running the business? Uh, we use uh, obviously online chat systems. Um, that's huge for us. Because, what do you use? Um, right now I think we're using Olark. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're using Olark. Um, so we integrate that integrates nicely with our CRM and our shopping cart so like if somebody has a chat or something like that it can dump right into our CRM mm-hmm. but that is to me any website that's truly a business is going to have somebody dedicated to that because you you can potentially lose so much business by not having somebody there to answer yeah. a question right there like if they have to bounce off and go somewhere else to get a question, uh, yeah. question answered you're losing that customer 
Um, yeah. And it's kind of addictive if you have it and you see them enter into your site. You're like, ah, there's someone yeah. on my site right now. So how do you manage this? Is there a customer service person that just pays attention to that? or? Yes, we have – right now we have three customer service people and they kind of rotate throughout the day mm-hmm. uh, taking turns on, on using the software. Um, but, yeah, to me that's probably been one of the, the key tools that we use is just having somebody present so that it doesn't feel like you're just at a website. You actually feel like you're dealing with a business that you can talk mm-hmm, to someone. Mm-hmm. Um, other software we use like Hootsuite and some of that stuff for uh, social media posting. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think what other software we're using right now. Uh, a lot of it's like analytics stuff um, that I don't deal with directly, but we have like the marketing teams are using fully integrated analytics to make sure that we're doing UTM tracking and everything that you need to do to like really hone in on our, our advertising costs. Um, email campaigns we actually use um, Mailchimp for our email. Uh, I know most people probably wouldn't use that, but for us, Why? for us, we don't deal with like our mailing list isn't like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people like some of the informational uh, products would be. So for us, Mailchimp is perfect because it's just an easy way we can uh, we can use analytics coming out of Mailchimp uh, yeah. to integrate some of our other stuff. Uh, it's just been an easy platform for us to use, so it's kind of what we focused on uh, yeah. for Mail. Yeah. In terms of other software programs, those are the three that kind of come to mind. Those are the main ones? Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the live chat ones because I that doesn't get mentioned a lot, actually, and it is critical, that interaction with the customer. Um, so, Gary, I'm going to do a quick word from the sponsor. So this this integrates you know perfectly in the conversation because, you know, with Scubana, who is sponsoring it, they combine all software tools currently to run your e-commerce business on a centralized cloud platform for a fraction of the cost. And why wouldn't someone do that, right? Absolutely, they do it. And I use them personally, actually. What I love about them is because they automate processes, so I don't have to touch them. You know, from ordering to product shipping, they do it like exactly what you're talking about earlier about the profitability is huge. You don't understand the shipping cost. They do a skew profitability report, so it tells me what products are actually making money and what ones are losing me money. So I don't sell them anymore. So that's the the plug for Scubana. Um, Mentors. Um, You know, one thing that comes to mind with your story, Gary, is, um, you know, not saying this journey is easy. It's not at all. But before you started RTA Cabinet Store, you had an interesting uh, lead-in story when you were about 28, 29. You want to tell people what happened with that? Yeah. I uh, So like I mentioned before, I was in logistics for 10 years or whatever. Um, when I, sorry, when I got out of college, and uh, I was actually working for a company that worked with Walmart. So we would, anytime Walmart brought on a new vendor, we would go to that vendor and tell them how bad their life's going to suck after working with Walmart. Like we, you know, tell them how to get product in there, everything that would go into the logistics of working with Walmart. Um, and I was like, you know, after helping all these different companies, I'm like, man, I can really do this myself. Like, there's, I know the logistics side of it. I know everything else that goes on. I've got a marketing background. Um, so I spent two years looking for a business. At that time, I had no knowledge of it other than that, oh, I'll just go out and I'll buy one. I didn't know how to start one. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I found an industry. Uh, it was actually the dollar store niche that um, I found that was you know, still booming at the time. Products were fairly inexpensive. They were all coming from China, which I had experience from. Right. Um, so I got investors to buy it, to help me buy into it, um, bought it, and at the maybe the seventh month mark, cost of petroleum went through the roof. Um, and obviously everything in the dollar store is made out of plastic, which is made out of petroleum. So the cost of goods almost doubled up to, to even triple. Wow, really? Um, so Bad having timing. Just, but yeah, having just spent a lot of money on a business, and you know, we weren't cash flexible enough that we could survive like a big downturn. So within a year, I ended up cl- uh, closing that business, filing bankruptcy at the age of 30, which is a painful thing to face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of an ego boost or ego, ego crush. Um, so yeah, I was like, that was kind of when I came up with the idea of like, let's, let's just build a website. It was really just to try to keep that one alive and keep it afloat. Um, so we weren't thinking it's going to be like this big thing. It was just like, if we can make any money off this, let's just use it to keep this thing going. Just start uh, small and build from there. So inevitably that went out of business. Uh, the other, the other one closed, I filed a bankruptcy on that. Um, I went back into sales. So I was traveling, working from a hotel. I was building the website in a hotel at night. So I'd work all day. Right. Come back to the hotel, sit there for four or five hours, and just write articles, do whatever I had to do to kind of get some traffic mm-hmm. going. So I was really doing double duty there for you know yeah. quite a while. Yeah. I'd say for the first year until we really got some really good traction going. But yeah, um, 
you know, for somebody starting out, like if you have any viewers that are like kind of just getting into it or trying to launch their own business, don't make the entrepreneurial mistake of saying, I'm going to quit my job and before you have a business, like right. have some to up. go and slowly build it. Don't think that you have to cut your job cold turkey and yeah. you know, suddenly jump into something big. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to talk about that because sometimes people see you and they see an overnight, you know, success or something like that. And it's a journey to get there. Oh. And yes. even before this journey, which is has got its, you know, challenges, there was a previous journey of, of figuring it out too. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, Gary, I appreciate your time. This has been hugely valuable. I love this and uh, talking awesome. about these details. And so I have one last set of questions. Um, and since it's this Cubana e-commerce mastery series, I always ask, what's been the, the lowest e-commerce moment and what's been the proudest? e-commerce moment well I mean, if I had to say lowest it would probably be the previous business and filing bankruptcy because uh, that was sort of an e-commerce business that we had um, that's a tough pill to swallow yeah. um, what was tough so about was, it like for people who haven't gone through it or people who have what was tough for you for me it was more letting the people down that I got to invest in it uh, it wasn't really I wasn't too concerned about me for whatever reason I've never been at risk adverse so uh, like even in this business, I'll take some risks that probably most people probably wouldn't take. Yeah. Um, but I know it's me that I'm impacting, and then at that time it was other people. So I think that was probably the hardest part of it. Like the fact that I went through that process of finding investors, they trusted me enough to invest in the product, yeah. and then I didn't, didn't have either the skill set or the circumstances around it. Just didn't work out to actually get their money back. So um, I think that was probably the toughest part of that was just dealing with the concept that I cost somebody else something instead of just myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of highs for us, yeah. um, obviously, my one that we're probably, I'm probably the most proud of is getting on the Inc. 500 um, the last four years, um, fully 100 the last three years. So kind of getting that uh, recognition um, that I know it's not just me, it's everybody in the, in the business, all the employees and everything, but um, being able to be recognized as something that, you know, especially coming from somebody that just filed bankruptcy 10 years ago and building up to yeah. a figure so I think that's probably what we're probably huge. Yeah. That's awesome. So what should we leave people with, Gary? We talked a lot about a lot of different things in e-commerce. What, yeah. what lesson should we end with? The lesson to end with is uh, I think kind of what we started with is like get to know who your real customer is. Like yeah. you can figure that if you're really in e-commerce and you, you want to build a business instead of just sell products, the easiest way to turn it into a business is to make sure you know who your customers are and talk directly to them. Um, don't just think that you have to advertise to everybody. Uh, focus in on the ones that are your true customer base and your conversions and your sales are going to go through the roof. Yeah, yeah. Gary, I appreciate this. My last question is, can you still dunk a basketball? Fun fact is, Gary played college basketball. It's a good question. Uh, I haven't tried in probably two years. <laughs> um, I like to think I could, but I'm not going to make any promises. <laughs> I would bet on you. But thank old. you. Get what, old. What's that? So I'm getting old. I don't know that I can anymore. You're six seven. I think you can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. I really appreciate it. This has been awesome. Awesome. Thanks for having me.